Can everyone hear me? OK, cool. Hi, I'm Amy Wabello. I go by Sailor HG on the internet. Um, I'm a programmer and electrical engineer by trade with an interest in combining computing and art and an interest in making STEM education more inclusive and accessible. After working as a web developer for several years, a couple years ago, I founded my own company called Bubble Sword Zines to try to write learning materials to make computer science concept more inclusive and accessible with stories and illustrations. And in that vein, this presentation is going to use illustrations to help prove the algorithm to calculate the phase of the moon. So let me set the scene for you. It was midnight and the witch sighed in her tower room as, midnight, as the moonlight danced through the window. She was deep in thought and calculation. These runes were giving her trouble, but she felt confident that she could solve them, and with them, the secrets of the moon, with a few more tries. The runes keeping her awake and keeping her from the secrets of the moon weren't Egyptian hieroglyphs nor ancient Etruscan. They were trigonometry. If you too have been frustrated or terrified by trigonometry, fret not. Would it be as satisfying to unlock the secrets of the universe if it were straightforward? It might be challenging, but we can do it right now, here, together. Let's use trigonometry to calculate the phases of the moon. So a couple months ago, I found this JavaScript library that makes astronomical calculations, including this function for calculating what fraction of the moon is illuminated on any given day. My first thought to myself was, whoa, this library is rad. My second thought was, can I prove this equation from first principles? And when I say first principles, I mean very first principles. Let's start off with a very basic question. What even is a moon phase? Depending on the day, sometimes we see the moon as a crescent, sometimes we see half of the moon lit, and sometimes we see the moon as a full circle. What causes this? So here we have the sun, the earth, and the moon, which orbits around the earth. These are not drawn to scale at all, FYI. <laughs> Notice that as the moon orbits around the earth, the side facing the sun is the only side that is illuminated. Imagine standing on earth as the moon is in each of these different points in its orbit around the Earth. For example, let's imagine standing on Earth, looking towards the moon in the direction of this arrow, while the moon is at its rightmost position here. What you see from Earth is, from the arrow's point of view, is the unlit side of the moon, what we know as a new moon. Now let's imagine standing on Earth, looking towards the moon in the direction of this arrow, while the moon is at its bottommost position here. What you see from Earth is that half of the circle of the moon is illuminated, what we know somewhat confusingly as a quarter moon. Now let's imagine standing on Earth, looking towards the moon in the direction of this arrow, while the moon is at the leftmost position here. What you see from Earth, from the arrow's point of view, is the full illuminated face of the moon, known as a full moon. Cool. So now we know that the moon phase depends on the relative positions of the moon, Earth, and Sun. Let's define some terms. The algorithm that we looked at uses two different angles, which are labeled in the comments as the geocentric elongation of the moon from the Sun and the selenocentric elongation of the Earth from the Sun. What does that even mean? So the word geocentric means centering the Earth. In other words, it means making calculations from the Earth's point of view as if the moon and sun revolve around it. We know that this is not actually true, but it just refers to using this reference point for calculations. The word selenocentric means centering the moon. In other words, it means making calculations from the point of view of the moon as if the Earth and the sun revolve around it. Again, this is not actually true but it just refers to using this reference point for calculations. And let's use these points of view to, de to define some angles we might use in our calculations. We'll use the angle between the moon and the sun from the Earth's point of view, and we'll call that phi. This is the geocentric elongation of the moon from the sun 
that the code was referring to. We'll also use the angle between the Earth and the Sun from the Moon's point of view, and we'll call that theta. Theta is this selenocentric elongation of the Moon from the Sun that the code was referring to. The code was using the variable name ink, but that isn't a Greek letter, so let's call it theta instead. At this point, it's worth remembering that the Earth, Moon, and Sun are three points in space, so they form a triangle. What information in this triangle do we know? One of the sides of the triangle has length equal to the distance between the Moon and the Earth. This is a known distance, and this distance doesn't change as the Moon revolves around the Earth and as the Earth revolves around the Sun. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is also a known distance, so we know the length of that side of the triangle. The last side of the triangle will change in length depending on the angles between the Earth, Moon, and Sun. Do we know any of those angles? Well, phi, the geocentric elongation of the Moon from the Sun that we were referring to, the, in other words, the angle that the Moon and Sun form from the point of view of the Earth, is something that we can observe given that we are on Earth. It's not uh, constant, but since we can observe and measure it, let's count it as known. With this information, we can calculate the last side, C, with a law of cosine. A quick refresher on the law of cosines. It lets you calculate the length of an unknown side of a triangle given its opposite angle and two other sides. So given that we know the values for phi, A, and B, C, the distance between the moon and the sun, is then the square root of A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine phi. And now that we know the length of C, we can calculate theta, the angle between the Earth and the Sun from the Moon's point of view, and we can calculate it using the law of sines. So, quick refresher on the law of sines. If we know all the sides of the triangle and one angle, we can calculate the rest of the angles via the law of sines. The law of sines states that the sine of an angle divided by the length of the side opposite that angle is equal to the sine of any other angle in that triangle divided by the length of the side opposite that angle. So in the case of our triangle, we can say that the sine of phi divided by C equals the sine of theta divided by B. And we can substitute in the value of C that we calculated from the law of cosines to get the answer for the sine of theta. And then knowing the sine of theta, theta is then the arc sine of that value. Now that we know how to calculate theta, the angle between the Earth and the Sun from the point of view of the Moon, let's see how it's related to the Moon phase. You might notice that as the Moon revolves around the Earth and changes phase, theta changes too. Can we find the equation that describes the relationship between theta and the fraction of the Moon that's visible from Earth? To make it clearer what part of the Moon is visible from Earth, at different points in its phase, we're adding a color key. The white area is the part illuminated by the sun. The lavender area is the part not illuminated by the sun. And finally, the dark purple area covers the side of the moon that faces away from Earth. So the white area that's left is what we can see of the moon from the Earth's point of view. Okay, so we'll try to figure out the equation that describes the relationship between theta and what fraction of the moon is illuminated and visible from Earth. Let's look at very specific example angles. When the angle between the Earth and Sun from the point of the view of the moon is 180 degrees, the illumination percent visible from Earth is zero. When the angle between the Earth and the Sun from the point of the moon, uh, point of view of the moon is zero degrees, the illumination percent is 100, a full moon. But those are very specific examples. How is theta related to the fraction of the moon that's visible for any arbitrary value of theta? So let's zoom in to try to figure that out. We do know that the sun lights exactly half of the moon, the 
right half and forms a perpendicular side, perpendicular with a side of the moon that's lit. So we can mark that perpendicular. That perpendicular means that we can mark this bottom lit area as having angle 90 minus theta. The Earth also forms a perpendicular with a side of the moon that is visible from Earth, the side opposite the dark purple side. So we can mark that as well. This perpendicular means that we can mark this upper lit area as having angle 90 minus theta as well. So adding up all of the lit areas of the moon, um, the lit area of the moon spans an angle of 100 minus theta or in radians, pi minus theta. So to calculate the illumination percent or fraction from um, the illumination angle, we can naively make this calculation um, using the angle illuminated by, divided by the total angle visible. So the angle illuminated is pi minus theta, and the total angle visible is 180 degrees or pi. But this doesn't accurately describe the illuminated percent that we see because the moon is a sphere and not a circle, and we need to take into account the moon's curvature and how our eyes perceive that curvature. So instead, we want to calculate the length of the projection of the curved surface of the moon that our eyes see. How do we calculate that projection? Let's assume we know the radius of the moon, which we do. When we project R down, we see that it's going to be a portion of the distance that we care about. What is the other portion? The other portion of the distance is a leg of this right triangle with hypotenuse R and inner angle theta, since the inner angle forms a straight line with the angle pi minus theta. And we know from trig that the length of a side adjacent to an angle in any right triangle is the hypotenuse times the cosine of that angle. That's the definition of the cosine, right? Adjacent over hypotenuse. So now we know that the length of the top side of the right triangle is r cosine theta, and we can project that down to the distance that we care about. Adding those two projected values together, now we know the length of the projection of the illuminated portion of the moon as visible from Earth. To calculate the fraction illuminated, we divide by the total projection, which is the diameter of the moon, in other words, 2r. When we simplify, the moon's radius cancels itself out, and we're left with cosine theta plus 1 over 2. Does that look familiar? So yay, we did it. From first principles, we calculated the same equation as this library for the fraction of the moon that's illuminated. So to recap, the fraction of the moon illuminated at any point in time can be calculated with the cosine of theta plus 1 over 2, where theta is the angle between the Earth and the Sun from the Moon's point of view. So I know that's a lot of information to digest at once, so I put all of it together in an interactive website for you to mess around with on your own, if you'd like. And it uses an interactive scrolling library called, called Scroll Llama, uh, made by the data visualization site The Pudding. And currently, it's only desktop friendly, but I'm working on making it mobile friendly soon. Um, and I can briefly demo it right now. OK. So as you scroll, um, it'll kind of like uh, have some of the uh, interactions from the presentation. Like it'll slowly add all the pieces of information that we know about this triangle.
or slowly add all the angles that um, we figure out um, in the zoomed in image of the moon and theta. Um, yeah, so it's at witchy.co slash trig um, if you want to mess around with it. Yeah, so that's it. Thanks for listening. Um,